With an understanding of the particles within the atom and isotopes under our belt, let's move to talking about the periodic properties of the elements and introduce ionization energy. After it became clear that an element was defined by its number of protons, people started looking for correlations between the number of protons or the atomic mass and physical properties, measurable quantities. One that emerged was a trend in X-ray frequencies. The experiment here is to bombard an atom with very, very high energy radiation. The atom can absorb that radiation and emit x-rays. If we look at the lowest energy x-rays emitted by an atom, we find a remarkable trend. If we arrange the elements in order of increasing atomic mass and just kind of pin an index to each atom, with a couple of exceptions, which I've actually taken out of this plot, we get a very nice quadratic relationship between what's called the atomic number of the element and its lowest energy x-ray frequency. There's a beautiful quadratic relationship here. What this tells us is that this index that we've used, the so-called atomic number, probably has some kind of physical meaning since we can correlate it with a physical property, this x-ray frequency. As you probably already know, atomic number defines an atom as a particular element and counts the number of protons in the nucleus. If we add or remove a proton to or from the nucleus, we get to a different element. And in fact, that process of adding or removing a proton is a nuclear process. It's not really a chemical process, so we won't concern ourselves here at least with nuclear processes. The most important thing to know now is that atomic number defines the elements and counts the number of protons in the nucleus. X-ray frequency is actually rather unique in that it's related in a direct way to atomic number. For the most part, other elemental properties do not display this very nice, very simple upward trend with atomic number. Even elements that differ in only one proton can have very different properties, and elements that we find separated by very large differences in atomic number can have very similar properties. A good example of this difference in properties for two elements that are right next to each other in atomic number is carbon and nitrogen. Elemental carbon, as you may be aware, is either diamond, which you see here, or graphite. Elemental nitrogen is a gas at room temperature. And you may have seen elemental nitrogen in liquid form as well as, as liquid in two. So clearly, two elements with very similar atomic numbers can have very different properties. Elemental carbon is a very nice solid. Elemental nitrogen, a gas. When plotted against atomic number, most elemental properties are not linear or direct relationships, but instead display periodic behavior. So remember what a periodic function is. A periodic function is one that repeats over and over and over again. So just to show the idea in general here on just a generic set of axes, a periodic function is something like the sine function, which goes up and down and up and down and up and down over and over and over and over again. And we can identify certain things about periodic functions. For example, the time it takes to get back to where we started, right, which is known as the period of the function. We can notice in a periodic function that there are corresponding points. For example, there's a point here that's on the upward rise of the function, and there's a corresponding point one period away in that same position. The elements display periodic behavior, and through the remainder of the videos in this section, we're going to see a number of examples of this. The first property we're going to look at is called ionization energy. Ionization energy is defined as the energy required to eject an electron from an atom. So experimentally, we take a collection of atoms, we bombard said atoms with very high energy radiation until we're able to recognize when an electron has been ejected from the atom. The amount of energy required to do this, usually for a mole of atoms expressed in kilojoules per mole, is defined as the ionization energy. In chemical equation form, it looks something like this. We start with atoms of A in the gas phase, and we bombard them with energy to produce an A plus ion, also in the gas phase, and an ejected electron, E minus. The per mole change in enthalpy for this process is what we define as the ionization energy. We'll talk specifically about what enthalpy means in a later video, but for now, you can just imagine that this is the energy required to do this process. 
Ionization energy is always positive because it always takes energy to eject an electron from the atom. To give you an example, for a mole of hydrogen atoms, the energy required here is 1,320 kilojoules per mole, which is quite a lot of energy. This is about one and a half times the amount of energy released in a mole of thermite reactions. And if you've ever seen the thermite reaction, that is a lot of energy required to eject electrons from a mole of hydrogen atoms. Looking at how ionization energy varies across the elements gives us insight into the nature of electrons within the atom. So here's a plot that lays it all out for you. Atomic number on the x-axis, ionization energy on the y. And notice that we're getting this lovely periodic be behavior as we move along this curve. Ionization energy goes up, comes back down, climbs again, falls rapidly, climbs again, falls rapidly as we move along here, right? This is periodic behavior. In fact, it almost looks like a sawtooth wave, right? Something like this. It is trending downward a little bit this way, but this is definitely periodic behavior in the first ionization energies of the elements. And we'll talk about what that first designator means and why it's important here in a second. We can also look at subsequent ionization energies. So for example, if we take A plus in the gas phase, and bombard it with energy to form A2+, plus, also a gaseous ion, and another electron. This is what we call the second ionization energy. Since we're starting with a cation, we're starting with something that's already lost, one electron, and we're ionizing it again. We can look at the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. ionization energies for a variety of elements. And what I want you to notice here is that there is a transition between two of the ionization energies where there's a very large, an abnormally large, in fact, jump from one ionization energy to the other. So for example, for sodium, it's from the first to the second. The first ionization energy is quite low, actually, if you think about hydrogen being up around 1300, this is very low for the first ionization energy of sodium. We'll talk about why that is shortly. But then there's a huge jump for the second ionization energy. This is much, much larger. We look at magnesium, there's a huge jump from the second to the third. Aluminum, the third to the fourth. Silicon, the fourth to the fifth. So there's a trend here, right? And this is increasing atomic number. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, etc., is increasing in an atomic number. And we're noticing a trend as we move to greater atomic numbers. So let's summarize the trends we've seen so far. In the first plot, we saw that the first ionization energy increases across a, seri a series of elements and then abruptly dips. Looks like a sawtooth wave, right? Something like this. On the whole, though, as we move to larger atomic numbers, ionization energy trends downward. So again, as we move further to the right, in general, the ionization energy is decreasing. We also notice that every element has a later ionization energy, second, third, fourth, etc., at which a jump in energy occurs between that ionization energy and the one that came before it. The position of the jump increments by one as we move across a series of elements, but does eventually reset. So we only looked at one set of elements, but if we had continued going, we would have noticed that the position of the jump actually resets when we get to a high enough atomic number. Let's think now about what these trends suggest about the positions of electrons in atoms as atomic number increases. What is ionization energy really measuring? Well, consider Coulomb's law. It says that the energy of two charges is proportional to their product divided by the distance between them. If we think of ionization energy as the energy required to overcome Coulombic attraction, so if we think of IE as the negative of the Coulombic energy, and we recognize that the charges of the electron and the proton are what they are, so charge is irrelevant, we can think of ionization energy as a measure of the distance of the electron from the nucleus. What the first ionization energy seem to suggest is that, at least within a finite series of elements, as we add electrons, those electrons actually get slightly closer to the nucleus, right? Ionization energy is increasing, which means the distance r between the electron and the nucleus is actually decreasing somewhat as we add more electrons to the atom, which is interesting to think about. But then we see an abrupt dip, an abrupt decrease in the ionization energy. And that means that R increases, right? If the Coulombic energy goes down, that means R must increase. There's a very large jump to a much larger distance. But we again 
kind of restart this process of adding electrons that are progressively a little bit closer to the nucleus. The subsequent ionization energies also support this idea. We saw that there's a series of ionization energies that increase slightly as we remove these outer electrons from the atom first, but then at some point we run out of electrons at this distance from the nucleus and we have to start removing these electrons that are further in, closer to the nucleus, that have higher Coulombic energies. And so at some point there's a big jump in ionization energy when we run out of these outer electrons and have to start removing the inner core electrons. These observations suggest a model of electrons within the atom in which electrons kind of bunch together in groups. And we're going to talk about that atom in detail in a couple of videos and then in the next set of videos when we talk about the quantum mechanical nature of atoms.